Uh, dear colleagues, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you today to the IEA's uh, webinar on biomethane, uh, which aims to take stock of where policies and markets uh, stand today, as well as highlight where the additional progress uh, could be made uh, in order to reach uh, target, targeted or a potential uh, production. Uh, today's webinar is part of the IEA's uh, Low Emissions uh, Gas Work Program, uh, which has been developed to closely monitor market developments in this sphere and facilitate dialogue uh, between stakeholders both within and across markets. Uh, this work is supported by the Clean Energy Transitions Program, uh, CTP, the IEA's uh, flagship initiative to accelerate progress towards the, uh, uh, the goal of uh, global net zero emissions. Uh, CTP uh, aims to turn uh, the targets into action uh, through direct engagement uh, with the countries and regions, uh, helping develop projects uh, with a primary focus on implementation. And CTP also supports international uh, clean energy collaboration in many uh, different fora, such as the uh, G20, G7, COP, and others. As a source of uh, low carbon energy uh, produced domestically and from waste uh, products, uh, the biomethane, also called the uh, renewable natural gas, has key potential in helping reduce energy related greenhouse gas emissions, uh, provide system flexibility and bolster energy security. Furthermore, with essentially identical properties to natural gas, biomethane can be injected into natural gas grids and used in traditional applications without the need for a retrofitting infrastructure. Policy instruments have been central to driving biomethane production and creating market structures around which the industry can grow. Uh, today's webinar aims to highlight the policies and incentives that have most uh, supported the industry across the various markets represented uh, around the table and which adjustments could help accelerate the uptake of biomethane. Now, I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, the, our four speakers. Uh, Mr. Anand Kumar uh, J.H.A., uh, Deputy uh, Secretary at the Indian Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. Uh, Mr. Sam Wade, Director of Public Policy at the RNG Coalition in the United States. Uh, Mr. Harman Decker, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the European Biogas Association, and uh, Ms. Uh, Renata Isfar, uh, the Executive President of the Brazilian uh, Biogas Association, as well as uh, Gergi Molna and uh, Frederick Ritter, both gas analysts at our agency. So uh, thank you uh, for joining us in this webinar and what I hope uh, will be a valuable uh, discussion for all. Thank you for your attention. Um, big case, Ken. Many thanks for your kind words of introduction. Um, dear colleagues, um, good morning, good afternoon, depending on from where you are joining us today. Uh, my name is Gergely Moner. I'm a gas analyst at the International Energy Agency, and it is again a great uh, pleasure to welcome you at today's um, webinar. Um, as you can see, um, we have a rather packed agenda uh, for today's uh, webinar. Uh, first, we will start with a brief introductory presentation, which will be followed by the panel presentations moderated by my colleague, Frederick Ritter. As mentioned by uh, Director uh, Sadamori, today's webinar aims to provide a global stop take on biomethane developments with a focus on key for markets, Brazil, India, Europe, and North America. In the first presentation, we would like to give a global perspective on biomethane, sort of an appetizer for the panel discussions, which will fo focus more on the regional dynamics. But before diving into today's presentation, please allow me to um, say a couple of words about the IA's Low Emission Gases Work Program. We set up this work program about uh, two years ago uh, with the aim to enhance our analysis on the short and medium term developments related to low emissions gases. It is based on four 
key pillars. We follow a technology neutral approach with all low emission gases being considered, including biomethane, low emissions hydrogen, and emethane. The work program aims to enhance market transparency, provide guidance on the system integration of low emission gases, and promote producer-consumer dialogue. And one of the reasons why we are looking so closely to low emission gases is because we expect that their deployment will accelerate over the medium term. In our latest forecast, the supply of low emission gases is expected to more than double by 2027, translating into an increase of 16 BCM in absolute terms. And as you can see on this graph, the majority of that will be supported by biomethane and low emissions hydrogen. Biomethane alone is expected to account for just over half of this growth. Now, there are various best ways to produce biogas and biomethane, and this slide shows us a simplified scheme of biomethane production from anaerobic digestion, which accounts for approximately 90% of biomethane production today. Biomethane is produced essentially through a two-step process. First, feedstock, which can come from a variety of sources, is converted to biogas via anaerobic digestion. At this stage, biogas typically contains 50 to 70% of methane. The rest is essentially um, CO2 and other gases like nitrogen. One important byproduct is digestate, which can be used as an organic fertilizer while also contributing to soil health. And biogas can be used locally to generate heat, electricity, as well as be used as a cooking fuel. But it can be also um, cleaned and upgraded um, to pipeline quality gas, which is indeed called biomethane or renewable natural gas. And here again, we have an interesting byproduct called biogenic CO2, which can be used in various industries, including chemicals, building materials, but also more strategic sectors such as beer production. One great thing about biomethane is that it is perfectly interchangeable with natural gas, and as such, it can be in injected either in the transmission or distribution grids and can be used in all the different sectors in which natural gas is used today, including power and heat generation, transport, space heating, and industry. It can be also liquefied and transported via long distances with LNG carriers. The first bio LNG cargo was imported by Japan from the United States in March of this year. Also bio LNG is a perfect match with energy trucks, which are rapidly growing these days. Now, looking back a bit in history, we see that global biomethane production rose by more than sevenfold since 2013. And as we can see on this chart, um, the pace of this growth has doubled in the last five years. And Europe and North America has been largely dominating this goes with biomethane benefiting from various subsidy schemes and well-developed gas network. Most recent data for 2023 confirms this strong growth with global biomethane production rising by 15% compared to 2022. Um, the United States further solidified its position as the world's largest producer of renewable natural gas with the country's biomethane output rising by more than 15% to around 3 BCM. And this strong growth is largely underpinned by demand coming from the transport sector. Similarly, uh, we see that in Europe, uh, biomethane production is increasing also at double digit uh, rates, and this is primarily supported by Denmark, France, and Italy. But besides Europe and North America, we also see strong growth coming from Brazil, China, and India. But of course, policies will be key to unleash the full potential of biomethane. And this map provides us with an overview of some of the most recent biomethane policies. In the United States, the Environmental 
Protection Agency revised upwards the renewable natural gas targets under the Renewable Fuel Standard Program. And Sam from the RNG Coalition will provide us with further details on the US RNG landscape. In the European Union, the Repower EU plan introduced a non-binding target of 35 BCM of biomethane production by 2030. And we also have seen that biomethane targets are being firmed up in the member states' energy and climate plans. And of course, Harman from the European Biogas Association will talk about these developments in greater detail. In India, the government approved mandatory blending uh, of compressed biogas into the domestic gas supply. And Anand from the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas will give us further details on this very important initiative. And of course, in Brazil, Pre President Lula just a bit more than a month ago enacted the fuel of the future law, which also includes the national program uh, for the promotion of biomethane. Renata from the Brazilian Biogas Association will provide us with an overview of the various uh, regulatory initiatives and policies which are being uh, currently implemented in Brazil. So looking at the future, um, biomethane production is expected to double between 2023 and 27, primarily supported by projects undertaken in Europe, North America and Brazil. So global biomethane is expected to rise to around uh, 16 BCM by 2027, and this represents a significant upward revision compared to our previous medium-term outlook, and it is indeed reflective of this growing policy support. As you can see, this outlook is still very much dominated by Europe and North America, accounting for approximately 80% of incremental supply, but we also see some very strong potential coming from Brazil and India. In Brazil, uh, RNG output is expected to quadruple uh, compared to its 2022 uh, levels, making the country the sixth largest biomethane producer in the world. And in the case of India, um, the mandatory blending of compressed biogas or CBG into the domestic gas supply is expected to boost CBG by more than tenfold over the medium term. Now, of course, biomethane costs remain relatively high when compared to natural gas on a purely calorific basis. Biomethane production costs in Europe are estimated to be in the range of 17 to 25 dollars per MMBTU, which compares with TTF prices at the moment, uh, trading at around $14 uh, per MMBTU. So there should be, of course, a focus on production cost reductions, but we also believe that there is a need to better recognize the positive externalities of biomethane. And because of that, uh, the scale-up of biomethane requires an effective framework of subsidy schemes and support mechanisms along the entire value chain, including production, transportation, and demand creation. State-backed risk-sharing mechanisms, such as contracts for difference, can help to de-risk investment and improve the economic feasibility of biomethane products. But it is also key to ensure the system integration of biomethane. Um, this includes providing priority grid access enabling reverse flows between distribution and transmission networks, as well as facilitating uh, the access to storage sites. And in this context, guarantees of origins and proper accounting systems can facilitate also the development of trading, as well as allow the initial price discovery for biomethane. In addition, demand creation should be also a key instrument which uh, would stimulate investment, including via fuel standards, public procurement rules, and blending ob obligations. Dear colleagues, please allow me to um, conclude with some key takeaways. Um, we see that um, low emission gases are really in, in the fast lane. We expect uh, that they will more than double 
in the medium term, with biomethane alone accounting for more than half of this growth. And this really um, underlines the maturity of biomethane as, as a low emission um, fuel. We have seen that um, global biomethane production has been increasing quite steeply, more than sevenfold since 2013. And this growth has been largely um, dominated by Europe and North America. Looking forward, uh, we expect uh, that global biomethane production will uh, double uh, by 2027. Um, and here we see that uh, newcomers such as Brazil and India will be increasingly important contributors to that growth. But we also think that further efforts are required to reach the ambitious targets set by governments. Biomethane production costs remain relatively high compared to um, gas prices. And this highlights not only the need to reduce production costs, but also the need to better recognize the positive externalities of biomethane. And this is why we think that there is a need for a holistic approach to support mechanisms, including state-backed risk sharing, priority grid access, and demand creation in key end use sectors such as transport. Dear colleagues, I would like to thank you. Thanks very much, Gergay, for, for opening this up and for, for this, uh, this highlight, this high-level highlight of, uh, of where we see uh, biomethane uh, evolving in the short term. Um, so just as a reminder for the rest of the, uh, the um, webinar today, we'll have each of our four uh, participants um, uh, coming in uh, in turn with a 10 to 15 minute presentation. Uh, I invite everybody who's listening to us to uh, put forward their uh, potential questions or comments through the Q&A um, uh, function of, uh, of this, uh, this uh, webinar platform. Um, we will either take some of these questions uh, after each presentation or take them on at the end. So I would ask everybody who's asking questions to maybe be a little bit specific about um, which markets or to who, which which um, uh, speaker they're, uh, they're asking their questions. So Sam, I'll um, let you start us off. I'll bring up your presentation here um, and we should be good to go. Thank you very much, Frederick, and uh, a pleasure to follow Gregory. Uh, he did a great job of summarizing how how things look across um, the entire world. We're going to focus a little bit now on North America. Um, I'm Sam Wade, Director of Public Policy for the Coalition for Renewable Natural Gas. If I could have the next slide, please, uh, just a little bit about our organization. Um, we are the National Trade Association in the U.S. and Canada for renewable natural gas interests. We advocate for the sustainable development, deployment, and utilization of RNG so that present and future generations will have access to domestic, renewable, clean fuel and energy. We now have over 400 members across the entire supply chain, and we represent approximately 98% of the RNG supplied in North America. Next slide, please. So North American markets have been evolving rapidly. Um, we now have uh, mandatory voluntary policies in over 44 states and provinces. Uh, the total amount of RNG production capacity in North America is approximately 143 tariff BTUs per year. Um, and we have another sort of uh, order of magnitude of that coming or, or 2X that uh, approximately 187 additional tariff BTUs under construction or planned. That represents approximately 2% of uh, total US gas demand um, if you exclude power demand from, from total consumption. So roughly 2% of, of uh, gas delivered to customers that aren't producing power. Um, and we can now say that the industry has created uh, over $7 billion in GDP impact in 2024, roughly. And that we support, uh, you know, tens of thousands of jobs, um, roughly fifty thousand, uh, per our most recent estimates. Next slide, please. So RNG is sourced from a wide variety of feedstocks in North America. The largest being uh, municipal solid waste um, through primarily landfill gas projects. Um, MSW represents the largest volume of RNG produced and therefore the largest amount of fossil gas displaced 
Um, however, the other feedstocks are also very important for, for other reasons. Um, the agricultural projects have over 200 projects in operation, but they tend to be smaller than, than the, the MSW projects. So the uh, dairy space especially represents a large number of projects um, and also has the benefit of reducing a significant amount of methane relative to other projects because um, often in the agricultural space, methane reductions um, or methane emit emissions are high and there's no requirement to control in the absence of an RNG project. Um, the wastewater and food waste uh, facilities are also uh, very important. For example, food waste plants offer some of the highest rates of job creation and GDP generation per MMBTU of RNG produced. And they also uh, allow uh, jurisdictions with organic waste diversion goals to pull material out of the landfills and um, uh, recycle important nutrients back into the agricultural system. Next slide, please. So the RNG coalition um, has a overarching goal that we're working toward, um, which we call our SMART initiative. It, that stands for Sustainable Methane Abatement and Recycling Timeline. Uh, what we've done with that goal is, is focus on capturing and controlling methane from the more than 43,000 waste sites across the US and Canada. And we've outlined benchmarks for North American RNG project development. Uh, our goals include shooting for 500 operating projects by the end of 2025, 1,000 operating projects by the end of 2030, and 5,000 operating projects by the end of uh, 2040. Um, as this map shows, we are on track to achieve the 2025 goal with over 433 projects now in operation. Um, we are also, we hope, on, on track for the 2030 goal with uh, approximately you know, more than another 400 in the pipeline, uh, totaling approximately 885 or so today. Of those projects, um, you can see a few trends regionally. Um, in fact, over 50% are located in the top five producing states, in including California, Texas, um, uh, Michigan, and New York, uh, Wisconsin. So we'd highlight that California has the most total number of projects in part due to supported policy that I'll get into in the next few slides, um, but that every state is now represented with, with at least one project, I think. Um, and that's a fantastic story. There's obviously the feedstocks are well distributed throughout the country. Um, we wanna see action in, in every US state and every Canadian province. So next slide, please. This slide provides a little history of how policy has helped support uh, growth of renewable natural gas um, in North America. For the initial period uh, of the industry's development, starting in 1982 um, through sort of the early 2000s, there was a very limited amount of projects built. Um, and in fact, that was because there was not much supportive policy and conventional gas is, is you know, relatively inexpensive in the US and Canada. Um, that began to change in approximately the 2005 through 2007 period when the Federal Renewable Fuel Standard was established, uh, and that was followed by uh, state-level low-carbon fuel standards or clean fuel standards, um, with California leading the way in, in 2011, uh, and Oregon following and Washington following uh, in years after that point. The important sort of motivator for a lot of the build out, as you can see, was the fact that the renewable fuel standard began recognizing RNG as a cellulosic fuel in the 2014 timeframe. Uh, that allowed uh, natural gas vehicles to begin to transition to use renewable natural gas. Uh, and we, we're now happy to report that in places like California, the natural gas fleet is entirely using renewable natural gas and we believe we can uh, approach saturation of the natural gas vehicle fleet in the next few years across the U.S. Um, so there has been, uh, as, as Gregory mentioned, a, a strong focus on use of, of RNG and transportation in the U.S. thus far, in part because um, both strong federal policies have existed and strong state level policies. Next slide, please. So on top of the RFS program, which has been the strongest driver federally in the US, we've also uh, had a recent round of 
significant tax credits um, that have made a variety of, of aspects of the RNG business more attractive. Um, there is an investment tax credit now focused on qualified biogas property. Uh, there is a clean hydrogen tax credit with the would su hopefully support significant RNG as an input to making hydrogen in the long run. Um, there is a clean fuel production tax credit focused on all clean fuels uh, and that is life cycle carbon intensity based. Um, and that should be a strong driver of RNG uh, among other transportation fuels. And then we also have focused staff tax credits and carbon uh, sequestration tax credits um, that have really ramped up in, in, under the Inflation Reduction Act. So those are also significant drivers of, of co-benefits associated with RNG projects. Next slide, please. At the state level, um, there is some desire to use RNG outside of transportation, uh, primarily um, through utility gas procurement standards. Historically, um, on the power production side, state level renewable portfolio standards have been very strong drivers of renewable adoption. And we've tried to replicate that with renewable gas blending standards uh, for, for various utilities, led primarily by the West Coast um, with California and Oregon and, and British Columbia, for example, all having strong utility gas blending goals. Um, in other states, there's also been the concept of clean heat standards, which allow some trade-offs between RNG and other types of uh, clean heat, including uh, liquid biofuel use and uh, electrification in some cases. Um, some of those programs are, are uh, life cycle based as well and, and are focused on greenhouse gas performance. Others are more um, just allowing the utility to, to look across its options and, and minimize costs uh, in finding ways to decarbonize and transition away from fossil gas. Next slide, please. So one of the most significant updates uh, recently um, is that California just this month did uh, adopt changes to their low carbon fuel standard, strengthening the state level pull uh, of RNG into the transportation markets. Um, it, we now have very aggressive goals for uh, low carbon fuels, again, across the West Coast of the US and across the entire country of Canada with a federal Canadian policy now in place. Um, Overall, the, the, the overlap between uh, the state level low carbon fuel standards, which are primarily life cycle driven, and um, the federal renewable fuel standard, which is uh, not life cycle based, um, is now being harmonized in part by the federal tax credits that I mentioned. And you see a strong focus on greenhouse gas performance, but also um, in, a desire to transition um, to zero emission vehicles in some of the West Coast states, especially and finding a, a role for renewable natural gas into zero emissions transportation has been an important dialogue uh, in the Western states. Next slide, please. There's also a, a broad effort um, to promote voluntary corporate action in the US and procurement of renewable natural gas by, by corporate buyers that have um, sustainable uh, energy goals. Um, the overall systems that have been set up around that uh, are built on uh, the World Resources Institute Greenhouse Gas Protocol and uh, the Center for Resources Solutions um, Sustainability Certification. And then uh, renewable natural gas tracking has also emerged as a very important topic. Um, the Midwestern Renewable Energy Tracking System, or MRETS, has set up a renewable thermal uh, registry for um, tracking green gas transactions. Um, that system is very flexible. It's primarily used in the voluntary markets thus far in North America, but it also is being included in some compliance markets. And the system allows, uh, basically ensures no double counting, allows tracking of carbon intensity, feedstock characteristics, vintage location, et cetera. Um, we believe that more discussions around um, registries and tracking are very important in North America. Uh, our green gas markets are a little bit less mature than in Europe and other places. And as exports uh, and international flows of RNG uh, continue to develop, um, obviously harmonizing tracking or allowing um, tracking systems to, to monitor uh, performance in, in each jurisdiction will be important. So uh, last slide, please. So just in summary, um, the RNG coalition has sort of a, a long-term vision of how North American renewable gases will evolve. 
In the near term, we're very focused on reducing methane emissions through our SMART initiative. As I mentioned, we want to build out uh, biogas and, and renewable natural gas facilities immediately to help reduce methane from all organic waste streams. Uh, and we see policy support um, uh, you know, sufficient to, to get us moving, as I've shown. Uh, we've had lo lots of rapid growth recently, but additional policy support is needed in the long term to ensure uh, that we maximize methane abatement. In the midterm, uh, we hope to prioritize RNG into hard to electrify sectors to not be in conflict with jurisdictions that have electrification goals. Um, we believe that during that period, RNG facilities uh, locations will be very important and um, co-locating uh, industrial uh, use will be, will be possible in some instances, but a strong uh, gas grid that still carries decarbonized uh, molecules in the long run um, will remain a critical part of, of North American infrastructure. Um, we also believe that in the long run, uh, it'll be important for RNG uh, inputs to be switched toward uh, potentially hydrogen um, or, or potentially e-methane, other, other energy carriers need to come in. Um, and we have to en enhance just uh, the total supply of renewable gas to serve any remaining gas demand. And as that occurs, if hydrogen becomes the dominant energy carrier, of course, um, carbon capture uh, will also play a, a large role in decarbonizing RNG supply. So uh, happy to sort of pause there. Hopefully that provides a good overview of, of what's occurring in North America. And thanks very much for the opportunity to, to speak again. That's great, Sam. Thank you very much. Um, we, we've actually got a couple couple questions that I'm, 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 I think I'm going to ask you one or two now before we, we get on to the, uh, the next presentations. Um, somebody has come in uh, uh, with a question on, on prices or, or cost, well, prices essentially, but, but behind it is a question on, on costs in a sense. Um, when does the US market uh, expect to remove or reduce incentives uh, towards RNG? And essentially, you know, deeper in that question is at what pace is the price delta between, uh, or, uh, between RNG and, uh, and natural gas uh, expected to be reduced? Is it expected to be reduced or are we looking in the long term at um, just an acceptance that in order to drive these alternative gases, we're going to have to put uh, uh, money and incentives uh, forward? Yeah, I, I think Gregory did a good job of summarizing um, how even in Europe, which has higher conventional gas prices, um, strong public policy frameworks will be needed to ensure RNG delivers its, its maximum potential. That's even more true in the U.S., um, where you do have, uh, you know, relatively cheap conventional gas, and in Canada, obviously a major conventional gas supplier as well. So we don't believe that, uh, you know, it's time to focus on removing um, sort of public policy support. We are in favor of public policies that provide strong competition to drive down production costs, um, and that you know policies that recognize all of the uh, benefits of RNG in various ways, including greenhouse gas performance, nutrient recycling, um, we believe could be better incentivized uh, and waste disposal benefits um, generally. So it, we, we recognize that the, the question of, is this a, a low cost source of, of gas is still a challenging one for many US policymakers. But what we have found is that it is a cost-effective source of greenhouse gas abatement, um, which the U.S. is, uh, you know, very focused on on finding still. That's great. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so I think th there are a couple other questions that are coming through, but just to make sure we get enough time for, for all of our speakers, I think we're going to leave some of these questions for uh, for the end when we can get everybody uh, sort of uh, interacting together. Um, so at this time, um, thanks very much, Sam. I think I'll, I'll invite Harmon to uh, to bring up uh, his slide deck and to um, take us on on uh, a little tour of, uh, of Europe. Thank you, Frederick, and it's my pleasure to do so. Um, also, thank you for inviting us to this uh, important webinar. Um, yes, I will share my screen um, and just let me know if you um, if you can see it. All right, we can see it. All right. Okay. Excellent. So. Um, um, I was asked to to give an overview on uh, what are the decarbonization strategies are of Europe in relation to biogases and uh, more sp uh, particular to biomethane. So um, 
let me try to do this. First of all, I would like to um, give you an overview of what we are. So I'm uh, Harm Decker. I'm the CEO of the European Biogas Association. We are representing, like uh, the RNG coalition in the USA, uh, the full value chain. Um, also, good to notice, though, that um, uh, the full value chain includes recently, in the past few years, also end users, as we see that end users increasingly are reaching out to um, uh, obtain biomethane for decarbonizing their processes. Um, so to share a few um, items, first of all, the socioeconomic impact, I think it is worthwhile to highlight. Um, the way um, biomethane is being produced is, uh, is important because we are local. Um, and already in Europe, we are providing um, almost a quarter of a million jobs. And we expect that this will go up to uh, 1.7 million jobs in 2050 with the growth which we are uh, showing currently. More than 15,000 companies are already uh, busy with that. And uh, also good to know is that we have in Europe 20,000, more than 20,000 biogas plants already in place. Now, let's have a look at what it means um, if we look at policy, how policy can support, but also maybe at some times pose a barrier, unintended barrier towards the development of biogases. First of all, let me sketch out uh, where uh, Europe is with their um, aim to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. And you see that they put in the Renewable Energy Directive a target of 45% renewable energy share by 2030. And on uh, the side, you see how this is being uh, shared between the buildings, transport and industry. And we really need to step up on each part to make sure that we can decarbonize as quickly as is needed. And biomethane is playing an important role into this. However, we are a uh, extraordinary regulated sector and um, this is um, what has been shown before back regularly as well, is that we have so many aspects which are uh, related to the production of biogas. Um, and my, one might um, even say that uh, digestate is not a byproduct or biogenic CO2 is not a byproduct, but energy is a byproduct. So you see here on the left hand side, uh, the inputs on uh, feedstocks, which are regulated by, for example, uh, the RED3, um, but also how um, the Waste Framework Directive or the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directives are impacting uh, the feedstock site. Then on the other uh, part, if you go to the production itself, you will have uh, the Soil Nitrates Directive, Soil Health Law, which all are imposing rules with regard to how we can keep our soils healthy. Um, and at the same time, of course, the carbon dioxide is also being regulated um, um, by the various, uh, various legislations. All in all, the outputs are packaged in the Fit for, 50, uh, Fit for 55 package, um, which is impacting the various industries as well. Um, so what we are always saying when a country is uh, moving up um, with regard to biomethane, it is good to put a special envoy in place to make sure that this person is overseeing the various legislations and make sure we cut the red tape and we are making sure that we are um, growing for biogas um, across the sectors. Now, what has Europe uh, done? And it was already alluded to in the beginning. Um, the most uh, prominent part, uh, which is done two years ago was the Repower EU uh, came about and there a, a non-binding target of 35 BCM of biomethane was put in place. Um, the focus was, of course, on biomethane to make sure that we could replace the natural gas. Um, but at the same time, we had various objectives. And we are working actually together with member states and the European Commission and the industry in total within the Biomethane Industrial Partnership to uh, ensure the production of this 35 BCM by 2030 will happen. Now, here you see on the bottom the four most important parts uh, which uh, will regulate and speed up this um, um, 
um, say the uptake of biomethane towards 2030. First is the planning. Um, we have to make sure that, of course, the 35 BCM is being anchored in the legislation so we can move up. But not only that, we need to look forward because 2030 is around the corner. So we are now already working towards new targets for biogas, biomethane in 2014, 2050. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, the market, of course, I've said it already. We need to ease the way we do business. Um, often um, bureaucracy is making it quite difficult, especially on the permitting part, but we need to cut red tape. We need to make sure that we can trade the biomethane across borders as well. Financing is another part which is uh, very important to, uh, to make it happen. And that can be in various ways to make sure that we um, have to, to, the right support mechanisms and to create uh, investor stability but also um, making sure that the finances are available and capital rollout can, uh, can happen for the biomethane uh, scale up. And as last part is we need to look towards the sustainable feedstocks that they are available um, to make the sharp increases we need. Now, I would like to mention one more because this was all the institutional cycle, uh, which, was, uh, which is ending um, uh, shortly. And we have a new institutional cycle coming up uh, with the new European Commission to be instituted uh, most expectedly in beginning of December. Um, but before uh, all that in the summer, there was an important report coming out from Draghi um, and the Draghi's report is it called. And there are three key areas which are being uh, discussed there, which will impact um, actually the full view on how Europe is being competitive and how we have to deal with renewable energy. Um, I'll just mention the three briefly. So Europe needs to refocus its collective efforts in closing the innovation cap uh, with the United Nations, uh, United States as well as, uh, as China, as we are lacking behind on the innovation part. Although good news on the biomethane side, I think on especially on the gasification side, Europe is well ahead. We also need to make sure that there is a joint plan for decarbonization, but at the same time, we need to remain competitive. And that is a big issue um, for Europe. Um, and there are also some good news for uh, biogas as we are at this moment um, in time, the cheapest renewable gas around and expected to be for the coming decades. Um, on top of that, of course, the security levels on energy, we all know um, how uh, at these times the, the world is getting um, more insecure than secure. So we need to make sure that we uh, cater for our energy needs and reduce our dependencies. And that is certainly the case for Europe. So having this in mind, let's have a look towards biomethane today. Um, and here we see that biomethane in Europe is growing extremely fast um, and also could uh, to tell that we have seen the largest increase uh, so far uh, for biomethane um, into 2023. Um, there is a webinar on this on the new statistics on the 4th of December, uh, something to, um, to maybe uh, scope out as well if you want to know more. But here we see this sharp increase, 4.2 BCM of uh, biomethane to be produced in 2022. We came out uh, this year with uh, the capacity already for biomethane in 2024, which was 6.4 BCM. I saw the numbers of uh, Krakerly um, with a little over 8 BCM in 2027. I think we are going to break this, uh, this number uh, quite easily. Um, then um, I was a little bit embarrassed to show this uh, slide because it just shows a, a large green blob, uh, but actually it shows where all the biomethane plants are centered. Um, the message of this is in each and every country where there are a lot of biomethane plants, the, where the green pens are, there is still enormous amount of growth. But on the side, you see even larger potential for those countries which um, have morally uh, a untapped growth uh, at this moment. So we still have a lot of work to do. The growth in the EU 27 um, over the last year was 20, uh, 37 percent. 
And in the total EU, it was 20%, which is still uh, very significant. Now, we get often the question, um, is there enough feedstock for uh, biogas? And um, I guess this question is coming from the fact that uh, biogas uh, production often takes place in rural areas at a farm. Um, and people see this as very small, but uh, as being said, more than 20,000 biogas plants, if you add them all together, it's an enormous amount. So if you look at the feedstocks which are there, you see actually a very um, interesting trend on the feedstock for the production of biomethane. Um, and watch especially uh, the gray uh, zone, which are the energy, the monocrops, the energy crops for the production of biomethane. By 2018, uh, we had a little increase in 2019, but then after that, it was completely phased out. So energy crops for biomethane is not being used. And if we look at the potentials, we see that there are enormous potentials available um, for the future. Um, before I go into uh, the potentials, uh, here you see how it is distributed um, by end use. Um, and uh, of course, I'm, I'm not doing right to uh, all of them. If you look at it, basically it is uh, evenly spread between transport building and industry and also power production from biomethane. And that last part is also important to know. We experience in the northern parts of Europe in the last four weeks, a kind of uh, a dunkel flight, flauter, as the Germans call it, or a windless winter week. So wind means there is no sun and no wind. And at that time, we needed to make sure the production of electricity is being supported by gas. And of course, here by methane can play an important role. So let's then have a look towards the production potentials based on sustainable um, feedstocks. Um, and here you see that there is a um, huge potential for biomethane within Europe. The numbers which I show here, and uh, especially look at 100, uh, the two, 2050, 151 BCM, that is not counting yet the use of um, abandoned land or contaminated land or novel feedstocks. It does not account for either yet synthetic methane coming from, for example, the biogenic CO2, combined with green hydrogen. So the potential is even larger than this. And this is a sustainable feedstock um, potential, meaning that um, the technical potential is way higher. We took a very careful uh, look at this. If you look towards 2040, um, the European Commission um, estimates that we need around about 117 uh, BCM of uh, gas, that is including natural gas, um, uh, but not including hydrogen. And with that, we can uh, fulfill uh, with the production and projections forecast 85% already. Is that doable? Yes, it is doable. If you look at countries like Denmark, which are um, going to have 100% biomethane in their gas grid by 2030. The most important part here is that we cover the Draghi um, paths where Draghi was saying we need security for our production uh, for energy we need to make sure it's affordable uh, for the consumers and it needs to be sustainable and biomethane is ticking all these boxes we are the cheapest at this moment the cheapest renewable gas available even though we are still um, more expensive than natural gas um, but we expect that it will change in future then one last slide on this is if we really want to step up, we need to unlock the investments which are um, available. Every year we do an investment outlook and we ask um, the industry how much they have set aside for the biomethane production. The latest uh, investment outlook, which we did in June was 27 billion was put aside. Uh, that is about 6.3 BCM about 950 plants focused on Denmark, Poland, and Italy. But the most important message is here, we need to make sure that this is going to be unlocked because it's not only renewable energy, it is also making sure that we make a product which is called biogenic CO2, which needs to be used. And uh, we can help to displace synthetic fertilizers. 
So this is a quick overview on, um, on um, what we have in Europe. Parman, thanks very much. Um, it, it's great to see this uh, this very forward looking view, and and, uh, and and for you to highlight this this ambition in the short term and long term is uh, is very interesting. Um, before we move on uh, move on to uh, to Brazil, there is a question that that has come through uh, in the chat, and I think I'll, I'll I'll sort of combine it with something that I I wanted to bring up uh, in, in listening to your presentation. Um, so I think the question is essentially here: uh, What are the um, uh, sorry, let me find it again. Uh, so essentially on, on the EU biomethane, it, do you have a little bit of a, a comment on the feedstock strategy and how you would view uh, purpose-grown crops? And I want to blend this into, into what, I, what I was thinking a little bit earlier as well, is this, this transition away from monocrops is quite interesting uh, because I think it does play into this, this idea that biomethane needs to fit into a wider context, it needs to fit into a number of adjacent value chains that are, that are agriculture and waste uh, and, and using these as, as, uh, as inputs. Um, and it also needs somewhat of a Bio, uh, a wider societal buy-in um, uh, from, from society to accept that we're not saying uh, there's a trade-off between food and, uh, for example, and, uh, and fuel. Um, so I wonder if you might have just a couple of words on the shift, uh, how it came about. Uh, I think it's quite clear in, in, in the chart that you showed. Uh, and, and maybe um, maybe just highlight the significance uh, for, for this shift um, uh, for, for the industry. Yeah, uh, thanks for the, the question, Frederick, and also uh, the one who posted in the, in the question and answers uh, box. Um, so yeah, if you look towards um, what has happened, that is basically the Renewable Energy Directive said if you would like to produce biomethane in a sustainable way, you need to stay away from monocrops um, in, that, in that sense. So it really drove positively the sector. If you look towards the feedstock um, in total, we when we calculate and I showed you the numbers, what is possible, um, that is already counting on only sustainable feedstock. Now, there is... Um, one interesting part, which especially in the in the warmer regions of uh, Europe can be uh, can be done, and that's the use of sequential crops, meaning that normally in places where the land is being um, underutilized, so in the time of the winter, and and the land stays abandoned till the next uh, food uh, crop or feed crop comes on, um, actually you can. Um, make use of the land in a very good way. That's a common agricultural practice, uh, practice for, for centuries, um, where you actually make sure you put a plant on which is um, um, enriching the soil on one hand, but you can use also it for production of um, sustainable energy. And that's called sequential crops, and those also being recognized in the RED3 as a part to uh, to be done. So this is those are important movements so we can help the farmers to revitalize the soil in one hand, but also to make sure that we produce sustainable energy. Great, thanks for that uh, the very succinct uh, answer as well. Uh, I realize that we're uh, we're not necessarily short on time, but I do want to make make sure that we leave enough time for our two our two uh, last presenters. Um, on that note, thanks very much, Harman, um, and uh, and we'll uh, give the floor over to uh, Renata from the Brazil um, uh, Biogas Association. So, please um, feel free to uh, sh tell us a little bit more about what's happening uh, in, in in Brazil. Well, it's a Great honor to be here and to show this presentation uh, for you. Let me just one moment. And there we go. Yes, there we go. So, um, a biogas is the Brazilian Biogas Association. It also represents biomethane. And so, uh, the same as our RNG Coalition and uh, EBA, we represent the full um, the full segment. We have producers, uh, we have uh, end, end users, and everyone is really interested now in biomethane in Brazil. It was until a very short time ago, not a topic in when you talked about public policies in the federal government, there was nothing to talk about, but uh, from uh, since a year ago, it's it has become a hot topic. Uh, it it's not uh, because we would say why is everyone talking about hydrogen here? Because we have so much potential, as I'm going to show you later. But people were talking about hydrogen and not about myomethane. But right now it is a hot topic, and we've seen a lot of change and a lot of interest in talking about biomethane, which is uh, 
just because of that, it's just like a big step that we are taking here. We are, uh, the step of the the of everyone understanding how important it is, e either for the energy transition and as well for our economic growth. So. Um, when you talk about uh, the energy matrix, it's interesting to show that Brazil comes in a very uh, privileged position because we have a lot of natural resources, renewable natural resources. When you look at our power matrix, it's usually around 93% using clean energy. And but if you look at the energy matrix, it also it is also very clean. It's like 49%. A lot of it is uh, due to biofuels because in Brazil we do have uh, a mandate to put 27% of gasoline in, 27% uh, of ethanol in gasoline, and now it's going to grow to 35%. It takes a lot from the transportation uh, emissions, which is which reduces a lot in our matrix, and, and it's responsible. I think of a third percent of our greenhouse emissions. Today, if you look at our greenhouse emissions, uh, the energy matrix, uh, the, the power matrix is not very big. Uh, it's because of, of its cleanness, it's not one of the biggest emissions. Uh, most of it comes from land use, uh, mainly because of uh, illegal, um, Sorry, sometimes I, the words in English, they escape me, but illegal, you know, fires and uh, arson. But when you look at, but we still have a lot of emissions from agriculture. And it's mainly because agriculture, it's really our, our motor, our big uh, economic sector. And usually the biggest economic sector is the one that has the most emissions. If you're a very industrialized country, it will be the industry sector that will have most of it, most of the emissions. And here, I mean, it's really the biggest uh, sector in Brazil. We export a lot. So there are a lot of emissions and the sector is starting to look at how you can make it to reduce your emissions, even though uh, there's there is a little, um, some people still don't see it as necessary as we wish it to. Uh, I've seen a change of mind from the last three years in the industry and the agricultural sector to recognize the importance of, uh, of energy transition and of reducing the emissions in Brazil, which is also a great step that we are going. Right now, Brazil is, is recognizing and putting in the main agenda decarbonization and how we can add to the world the important uh, concepts that will make it possible to to get the net zero by 2050 or to re reduce emissions by 2030. And I was very happy to see how G20, which is taking place right now, actually ended yesterday in Brazil, how biofuels became such a hot topic, an important topic to recognize the, the uh, life cycle analysis as an important topic to, to put uh, the uh, technology neutral uh, way to look at it. Because sometimes here we still have problems accepting certificates with biomethane. I believe all of you like JG protocol is big in Brazil for the industry and we have a lot of problems recognizing the, the, the attributes of biomethane in it and all this G20 talk about a just and an, a just and inclusive uh, transition has made a big impact and we believe it will it will help with that. When you look at the the growth of biomethane in Brazil, Today, we only have eight plants that are allowed to commercialize. It's uh, 6,017 cubic meters a day. I didn't cover, I, I see that you've been talking about year. I just have the day. We would just have to multiply by 365. But I'm a lawyer, so I'm not really good with numbers. I'll leave you to that. And But we do have uh, 23 plants in auto consumption. And there are 31 plants awaiting authorization in our national agency. It's a big growth. I mean, two of these authorizations, 
uh, just came out like last month. We had like six for a long time. But what we've seen is really uh, growth in in the interest in producing biomethane. Uh, we expect out of this, we do have this 31 awaiting authorization from our agency, but we do have another 31 plants that our associates in Biogas uh, told that they are planning to construct this year. And if you look at the, uh, until 2032, we will, we believe we will have 200 plants at least in Brazil. And what is interesting is that uh, because of our, uh, our difference for the world in terms of a big capacity. We we do we we didn't develop as well as we could, but as you will see soon enough, we have like this huge uh, potential, theoretic potential for growth. And by 2032, we believe we will have eight uh, million cubic meters a day, which is around 10% of our natural gas consumption. Last year we had uh, 63 million cubic meters uh, a day for natural gas. But if you take a look at the thermal, well, because thermal uh, production, thermal electric, it varies a lot from every year. But we made a calculation. It's usually if you, ten, if you get a 10 year, uh, a 10 year, uh, oh my God, I forgot the, <laughs> the name again. If you take over the 10 year, like in, in if you, just make uh, around 20 million a year. So that's how we can say that it will be around 10%. But we do believe that with the few, uh, few of the future, few of the future bill that has just passed, uh, it'll grow much more. We do not have the numbers, uh, but we believe it can grow up to 34 million cup, uh, cup meters a day. And we also are discussing our tax reform. And there is a disposition in our constitution that says, that uh, the the tax aliquota has to be smaller for biogas when you compare with its with its substitute fossil fuel uh, in order to make it competitive. And we've been talking to Congress to make sure it's enforced, and that will be a big big uh, important part of enabling biomethane to go to its full potential. Uh, when you look at what we have now, okay, right now when you talk about biogas, it's still 80% of our production is used for electricity. We have 1,365 biogas plants, but uh, when you look at investors in Brazil, most of uh, investors in power, uh, in power generation from biogas, they are changing to biomethane production, because here in Brazil, well, well, first of all, when you take a look at it, it's already 90% clean energy, renewable energy. And so, and we do have a big problem of uh, energy prices. So anything that will have an impact on prices, everyone is saying we don't want it. So that's why when you take a look at the auctions or at of, uh, of the new energy, production, it's just going solar and wind because they say, okay, no, we don't need biogas because it's more expensive than solar. And when you do need uh, the, the generation to be uh, stable and not intermittent, then they look at natural gas and they pay more in the last, in the last auctions in Brazil, they paid more for natural gas thermal plants than for biogas thermal plants. They look at the costs. They don't look at the attributes and how we add to the environment. And that's one of our biggest, uh, when you go to the Minister of Mines and Energy, that's one of our biggest goals there. We say, okay, so it doesn't make sense to pay more for natural gas. At least let us compete with natural gas in the same price because then all of the, the recent uh, investments in power generation with natural gas would certainly come to biogas, but let's see how it goes. Right now, the growth of solar has been so really, so uh, it, it was like a lot. And so there's probably not going to have an option so soon. So soon. Uh, when you look at biomethane, 
So we have two million cubic meters a day when you take when you consider the the planting authorization process, the self production, and the 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 eight authorized by ANP, which is around. Uh, while it's less than 1% of our potential, we do have a lot of potential here. When you take a look at our uh, our uh, theoretic potential in Brazil, it's 120 million cubic meters a day. Uh, it's double the, the natural gas consumption last year. And this doesn't, doesn't count the, I, I, put, I wrote it down, the purpose growth crop. This is just from waste. Uh, that we consider, and it 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 is actually um, a conservative approach. The biggest potential in Brazil is the sugarcane industry. Uh, when it when you take a look at the potential of each plant that you can use the residues from from the sugarcane and from the ethanol production, it's more it's more than it's around fifty percent of all of the potential that we have in Brazil. Uh, after that is animal manure, animal protein, then the residues from agriculture, and finally sanitation. Sanitation is not a big potential when you compare to the others, but when you take a look at these eight plants that we have today, six of them is from sanitation. It's just that it's the low-hanging fruit. They are closer to the consumers. They don't need as much uh, in, uh, in investments in infrastructure. So it's the ones that are coming up first, but sugarcane already is started to produce. They are really invested in, in making uh, biomethane happen. Uh, animal manure only is small plants, usually, usually looking for pigs and uh, that's mainly it, but we do have a great potential when you take a look of our uh, pe pecuary, how, how do you, sorry about, not remember, but when you take a look at our meat industry, it will be very big, but it's the one of the, the, the potentials that they are not, still not looking, especially because they are very far from infrastructure and infrastructure is um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the difficulties that we need to, to surpass in order to make all this potential happen. Uh, one thing that, uh, well, whenever we are talking abroad outside of Brazil, we like to say it's usually from waste, our, all of our production. Actually, all of the biogas production, bio, biofuels production in Brazil, it does not get into the problem that it's one of the resistance against biofuels. We do not have a competition between food and energy because uh, the the consumption has grown, uh, the, the, the production has grown without having to plant any other new area of, uh, of plants just because of energy. We are is still uh, the biggest uh, food producer in the world and we can do both. We can produce food and we can produce um, energy. So it's something that, uh, and, and of course, when you look at our production, everyone is, uh, is uh, concerned that it is made in a sustainable way. So that's one of the, the concerns in Brazil because we do export it. We know the world also has this concern. So we take care that our production takes all of the sustainable requirements necessary for the world. Uh, the bottlenecks that we have here, one of them is infrastructure. Uh, this map is not the best one to show because if you look at the green lines and red lines, these pipelines, they are not constructed. It's only the black ones. So it ju it's just in Brazilian coast. And the one that the one that comes from Bolivia, the uh, gas ball, and uh, also uh, one in the Amazon. But mainly it's a, a big problem, our bottleneck. And when you take a look at the discussions in the government, everyone is concerned because there is a lot of natural gas being reinjected in our, our oil reservatories and everyone is trying to make it happen and bring this natural gas here and if they had the same the same purpose and the same 
will to make it happen for biomethane, it would cost less because our infrastructure uh, will cost less than brings from offshore, from our prey out. And we are in a lot of the places, you have residues all over the country. So the infrastructure, you ha you'd have less distance to get to the consumers and it would be much better. But still, it's um, we are trying to conscientize, to, to make everyone awareness, trying to bring awareness to, to the sector. We are starting to get there, but it's still a long way to go. Uh, another thing that we, we have as a bottleneck is a regulatory framework because our, our uh, regulatory norms, they are made for natural gas. And it's something that it's starting to happen now how we are going to to put it for for example it's something new to inject it in the distribution pipeline so how do we do it some states they have regulations some didn't even talk about it and since it's new sometimes they consider the, they do not consider the fact that the volumes are much smaller than the natural gas volumes and that you have different aspects that you should look into and it also it's it's already a problem the natural gas framework because uh, we had a monopoly until a little time ago we still have a market uh, basically dominated by one agent petrobras so opening up the market is important not only for natural gas market but it's important for also for biomethane and biomethane will have help for you to uh, to to have more competition in the gas sector and not concentrate too much in one agent and it's something that we are trying to pass the message to everyone how it is important uh, costs are always a problem uh, in brazil nobody wants to pay nothing extra for the fact that it's a renewable energy Actually, when we are discussing the fuel of the future, our biggest, uh, our biggest, the biggest resistance was from the industry because they were concerned it would add more to their costs and they didn't want to pay. I even heard, I don't want one extra cent. I don't want a, a, a tenth of a cent. I don't, I, I can't have any more costs, but we, we made it like the bill has passed. And we believe that in the end, the, even the industry, when we have our origin certificate and they can separate the renewable attribute from the, the, the molecule, it will be a big gain even for the ones who, do not, who aren't looking to decarbonize yet. Uh, when you think of what we have regarding incentives in the federal system, the first that is going to be implemented is the fuel of the future. It has mainly two uh, two things that it came. One of them is a mandate to decarbonize the natural gas sector. So the natural gas producers and importers, they have to buy biomethane from 1% to 10%. It's probably going to start with 1%. But uh, it's a start, it's a way to, to have a signal of the market that will be demand. So producers are already talking about it and coming to the association. Everyone is looking into it just because of the discussion. The origin certificate will be very important in that regard as well. And uh, all of the discussions are happening right now, next week. There will be a workshop in the Ministry of Mines and Ed Energy to discuss how we are going to make it work. What are the next steps and how we can make it? Because it needs to be done by the end of 2025 because the mandate, it starts on January 1st of 2026. But Fuels of the Future was uh, one very important bill that has passed because it looks at all of the fuels that can decarbonize. We are have, very ha uh, happy for it. Mover is another recent bill that took a look into decarbonizing transport. Uh, it focused on, on light cars, but the Ministry of Industry is right now discussing another project looking into the trucks. And that is very important because 50% of the emissions in Brazil regarding the transportation sector comes from trucks. And uh, so it's one way, one thing that we do need to decarbonize. 
we do have uh, Renova Bio, which is a certificate of decarbonization as well for all of the biofuels. And it's been working now for four years and it's a, it's a big incentive and it has made it possible to be here today with the biomethane. Uh, this year we also had uh, hydrogen legal framework incentives. And the important thing is that there was a lot of lobbying to only talk about hydrogen from electrolysis, from power generated uh, hydrogen, but we were made to put it there. If you do it with uh, any, any low carbon hydrogen is getting the incentive. Um, we also... Yes. I'm, I'm so, so very sorry to interrupt, but it's just I, I'm, I'm very conscious of time that we have only about uh, 14 or 13 minutes left. And we, we, we would like to, to be able to, to give a chance as well to, uh, to Anand Kumar to, to, to be able to present. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you just a, a couple of moments. One minute. Could? OK, that'd be great. Thank you so much. OK, here are some states that we did that have incentives. Most of them is just uh, regarding taxes, reduction of taxes. And but we do have in the state of Rio a biomethane mandatory mixture. The problem is that they they say you have to buy it for five dollars a million BTU and then it doesn't work at all. But uh, we are working to change that in Rio. Uh, we are also discussing, as I said, tax uh, incentives in the tax reform. Uh, they created uh, one IVA. We had like a lot of taxes, and it it it. It brings uh, a possibility to have a reduced aliquota. And one of the difficulties that we have here is regarding finance. There's uh, not a lot of, uh, uh, actually there is money for that, but it's only for big companies. These small ones that look into biomethane, they are not able to get the, the, the financing. It's hard for them. And also, it, it looks for biomethane plants, but if you try to buy a truck that uses biomethane, they they cannot use the, the climate fund to get there. And that's something else that we are looking forward. That's it. Uh, sorry for taking so long and looking forward to hear from India now. No, thank you so much, Renata, and apologies for for interrupting. It's just that I, I have my eye on time, and I would uh, would want to make sure that we uh, that we don't uh, don't skip over India. Um, I think um, given given our limited time, we'll we'll jump uh, directly to uh, to uh, to the Indian markets, and uh, and we'll try to get to uh, uh, questions a little bit later if we have time. So, Anand, please um, uh, feel free to uh, to uh, start on on the Indian markets. If you'd like, I can bring slides up. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Frederick. Uh, I should be grateful. I would be grateful if you get the slides up. Here we go. Yep. Uh, on the presentation mode, if it is possible. Yep. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Frederick, Bugley, IA team, for giving this opportunity for uh, making a presentation on the scene, compressed biogas scene in India. We have been a late entrant uh, to this uh, bandwagon, especially of biomethane, though uh, we have been in biofuels journey for quite longer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Indian uh, share in global energy consumption is uh, likely to double uh, by 2050 from 6% to 13%. While oil and gas demand also increases, about uh, it increases, it triples uh, by 2050. The renewables renewables also increase about uh, 2.5 times uh, from uh, 262 million tons of oil equivalent to about 836 uh, of million tons of oil equivalent. Next slide, please. In this energy journey, uh, where do we see uh, India's? Uh, what is the vision for India's energy? And where do we uh, see gas, especially and especially biomethane, roll into it? Uh, as we uh, slide uh, go down this slide, we see uh, that uh, the target of uh, net zero by 2070, as uh, given by our uh, Prime Minister uh, in COP last year. So uh, we have a specific target, and then uh, along with the target for reduction uh, in the net zero emission in the emissions. We also have uh, 
import reduction targets, which we feel that with more uh, gas, uh, with, a, with a shift towards the gas-based economy, and also uh, more emphasis on biomethanation and production of biomethane, we could achieve a reduction in imports. The gas-based economy, again, uh, correlated to it. The gas-based economy, uh, we uh, intend to move from uh, move to 15% of the total uh, primary energy mix by 2030, wherein the circular economy and the whole of government approach towards uh, methanation, biomethanation, would come into uh, picture. Next slide, please. Considering all this uh, and under the national biofuels policy that India had, uh, we started with uh, sustainable alternative towards affordable transportation, which was a uh, uh, Satat initiative. Uh, again, uh, the idea was to convert biomass waste into uh, CBG and biofertilizer, and also uh, uh, the total investments amounting to about 1.75 lakh crore. Uh, plus about four lakhs of uh, employment, direct and unemployment, and direct and indirect employment, plus uh, additional income to farmers, uh, entrepreneurship, MSME sector uh, support. So, with with a broad uh, uh, with a broad set of goals, uh, we moved on this journey. Next slide, please. Now, uh, where do we go when we come to compressed biogas? What, where do we see ourselves? How do we move forward? So again, a, a very important pillar for India's commitment for net zero. And uh, the initial targets uh, are, are uh, to the tune of uh, 15 million tons per annum of CBG production, uh, uh, which would be about... Uh, so what, what this figure represents, and, and I talk of 2023 figures, 2024 figures, this figure represents about uh, uh, double of our current uh, natural gas consumption in transport sector. In the next five, six years or seven years, uh, by 2030, 31, when uh, the natural gas consumption in the transport sector uh, is about 15 million tons, we also intend to have uh, CPG production to that tune so that uh, we are able to kind of replace uh, the fossil fuel with biomethane in at least the transport sector. Uh, so those are initial uh, estimates, uh, esti uh, initial targets of CBG production. Uh, if we go to the potential, uh, the potential from different feedstocks is, is much, much uh, more than these initial targets uh, of about 15 million ton by about 2030. Along with the biogas uh, or CBG potential, what we are also looking at is the organic carbon sequestration, while a popular term would be uh, fermented organic manure or liquid fermented uh, organic manure. Uh, we believe it's, uh, it's, it's at par with inorganic carbon sequestration that the industry is talking about and the whole biomethane journey can, can contribute to organic carbon sequestration in the soil and uh, which again, uh, reducing dependence on the chemical fertilizers. So that, that's kind of a uh, double uh, benefit to the economy and double benefit to the environment wherein we first reduce the methane generation and then also uh, uh, reduce the use of chemical fertilizers in the soil. Now to all this, what we intend, uh, what is needed is that all the revenue streams of a particular biomethane project be that uh, biogas, be that uh, FOM or LFOM, or the carbon credits are properly monetized. Now, as as uh, as in the, as uh, was shown for European Union, the prices uh, uh, ranging at about seventeen dollars per mmbq in in EU, broadly the same prices uh, we have for CBG in India. While the methodology might be slightly different, wherein uh, uh, most of the CBG is being uh, linked, the price is linked to the alternate fuel, which is uh, CNG or natural gas in transport sector. 
but the price range is broadly uh, at $17 per mm BTO. And we uh, need to move towards uh, more standardization of product and production processes and other efficiencies so that uh, this, this gets more in competition with uh, the natural gas uh, available otherwise in the country, be that uh, domestic gas or LNG or RLNG. So we need to make biomethane uh, uh, a fighting force against the other uh, fuel so that it competes on its own. And for that, uh, monetization of uh, FOM, uh, fermented organ manure, or the carbon credits is uh, is very, very important. Uh, the government has been taking various steps on uh, ensuring monetization of these things. But these being early days, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we are taking steps towards it, but uh, it will take some time uh, before all, all of this is uh, uh, established and uh, we are able to get the benefits out of it. Next slide, please. Now, what, what is the government doing for promoting this uh, whole ecosystem of uh, compressed biogas? Well, uh, on the upstream side and on, on the feedstock side, we have, the government of India has come up with a scheme for uh, financial support uh, for procurement of biomass bio aggregation machinery, wherein uh, we give up to 50% of subsidy for uh, biomass aggregation which would be about uh, 9 crores, up to a maximum of 9 crores uh, per plant. Now, uh, because uh, because of the varied landscape across the country uh, with different feedstock, uh, uh, with, with different feedstock incentive areas, uh, we need to support the, the farmers, the farmer producer organizations, and also the uh, CBG producers in assuring a feedstock uh, to their plant before the production cycle begins every year. And therefore, uh, we have uh, this year itself come up with this scheme. Uh, on the downstream side, uh, again, because uh, a vast country with demand centers uh, situated across different regions, we need to take this biomethane uh, CBG to different parts of the country. What uh, the government has come up is uh, again a financial support of, of, of up to 50% of cost of laying the pipeline between the CBG plant and the nearest city gas distribution network. Uh, as as uh, you would be aware, uh, uh, we have uh, parallelly, uh, apart from the biomethane story, uh, India has uh, gone full throttle on establishing city gas distribution networks across all uh, states uh, in, in the country and uh, the pipeline laying process, establishment of uh, CNG stations and all of those processes are, uh, are uh, uh, there underway. So uh, one of the best ways we felt uh, uh, to assure complete offtake of CBG was to connect all those CBG plants to the city gas distribution network wherein both the producer and the consumer would have uh, 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 would be benefited. So the government is again supporting uh, uh, this pipeline through uh, uh, subsidy. On, on the demand side, uh, uh, and as uh, uh, Gurgli was saying, and, and uh, it was earlier mentioned, uh, we have this uh, blending uh, percentage of CBG into the natural gas consumption uh, segment. So initially, the blending percentage is linked to the total sale in uh, CNG transport in the transport and household uh, natural gas consumption segment, which currently is about uh, 27 million cubic meter per day uh, as of now, and is expected to increase to about uh, 50, 55 million cubic meter per day in the next uh, three, four, five years. So uh, the initial mandate is on uh, those uh, city gas distribution entities who are uh, selling uh, CNG and uh, pipe natural gas to households. Uh, while current, the current phase is a voluntary phase, 23, 24, uh, financial year 24, 25 uh, is a voluntary uh, phase. 25, 26 onwards, we would have 1% uh, 
obligation. Uh, then next year it's three uh, percent, four percent, and by 28-29 it is going to be five percent of uh, the total uh, consumption in CNG PNG segment. And uh, uh, and and this consumption, so the the mandate on CNG PNG is also uh, will all, will also be reviewed in uh, uh, four years, 28-29 in five years time, so that. Uh, the mandate could be increased or considered uh, to be spread across more more consumers. Uh, so uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. Now uh, we also have support uh, for uh, the financial assistance on on the capital subsidy part for establishing uh, plants. Then we have uh, for the fermented organic manure. Again, we have. A market development assistance uh, of about 1500 rupees per ton on FOM and LFOM uh, just to establish a market for FOM and help its offtake from the CBG plants. Then uh, the, the states in India are also coming up with different uh, incentives and different policies uh, to support this whole uh, ecosystem of uh, compressed biogas. So overall, I would say the central government and the states uh, together, uh, we are coming up with a very uh, uh, with a very supportive ecosystem for uh, establishing CBG plants, taking care of the upstream side, the downstream side, creating a demand for CBG in the mar uh, in the market, and uh, moving forward. So, uh, next slide, please. So. Uh, uh, as on, on this map of India, you would be able to see, I mean, this is a smaller version of the map, but in the northern and in the northern part, northwestern and southern part, we have a concentration of uh, compressed biogas plants, either commissioned or, or uh, under, under, under construction. So we have uh, 78 uh, plants commissioned, uh, 72 under construction, plus uh, about 200 more plants by the state-owned uh, uh, gas uh, and oil marketing companies in India. Plus, uh, we also have big corporate houses in India, uh, Adani and Reliance coming up with their own CPG plants. So, uh, in, the, in the last two, three years, uh, much interest has been created in the ecosystem in India. Uh, many of the corporate houses, big, big corporate houses, have uh, set up plants. They are in the process of setting up plants. And uh, we are expecting uh, a, a much more uh, number of plants coming up, uh, maybe reaching about 5,000 in, in, in some years, and uh, uh, to a production of about 15 million ton per annum of gas. Uh, if I talk of the current production capacities out of these 78 plants, uh, the total production currently is about uh, 50,000 tons per annum, about 0.05 million tons uh, per annum, uh, which, uh, if uh, compared to the transport and domestic sector natural gas consumption, it's about 0.5 percent of uh, the transport and uh, domestic natural gas consumption. Uh, compared to the last year uh, in 23, uh, 22, 23, it's it's more than 50 percent jump in total production of compressed biogas. And as uh, we move along, uh, we are seeing a much more uh, progressive, uh, extensive growth of compressed biogas production in the country. Next slide, please. Now, uh, where do we see forward? How, how do we intend to move forward? Uh, low cost financing is one of the issues that uh, uh, every CPG plant uh, is, is intending to move forward. And we have been in talks with multilateral uh, development agencies, uh, development uh, banks for uh, supporting low cost financing of CPG projects uh, through government supported or not support or, or through risk, risk sharing facility by those uh, multilateral development banks. Uh, plus, we are also looking at uh, getting into bio LNG thing uh, from uh, bio bios. Uh, from the CBG uh, through small scale liquefaction facilities being established at the far flung plants where the capacity is too big and 
the natural gas consumption or demand is not great in that area. Uh, simultaneously, looking at uh, CBG injection into the trunk uh, natural gas pipelines moving, moving across the country and uh, monetization of carbon credits uh, for which the new regulations are uh, being framed in India. So uh, with this, uh, broadly, the government push uh, on, on all cylinders, uh, we are hopeful for a, a great future for CBG in India. Plus, uh, we are also cognizant of the great progress that US and EU has already made. Uh, they've been at it for about 15, 20 years. Uh, we uh, we are late entering to the bank again, as we said earlier, but uh, we hope to catch up soon. Uh, thank you. That's all from uh, my side. Anand, thank you very much, um, and uh, thank you to 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 all four of our presenters, Anand, Renata, Herman, uh, and uh, Sam. Um, thanks very much for for staying with us, and also thanks very much to everybody who's who's stayed with us online. I realize we've gone a little bit over uh, over time, uh, but I do very much appreciate your attention. Um, I, I don't have a lot of time for well, we don't have much time for any questions, and I don't have a lot of time to to wrap this up. But um, I think we 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 are talking about four different regions, four different markets with with very different market and, and governance contexts. Um, uh, each of these regions, uh, I think, I think we see today has made quite a bit of project progress, either over the long term or even uh, over over the short term. Uh, of course, there is still, uh, I think, uh, a certain road to to, to go down in, in all four of these regions. Uh, but I think that that should be a, a sort of positive or encouraging note uh, because we do see a very forward looking view in in all four of these markets, and we do see potential for for for. Further growth. Um, uh, these are these are this is a very general takeaway. I wish I could have gone a little bit a little bit deeper with uh, with uh, certain questions, um, but uh, but given time, I think uh, I think we'll we'll close on this note. Uh, and a big thank you to all of our participants on on both sides of the screen. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.